June 2007. A young woman goes into a local Target looking to buy an anniversary gift for her boyfriend. Little did she know, however, she was being closely watched and followed. She was talking to her mother on the phone at Target, found what she wanted, uh, went to the checkout stand, and basically, I think, closed out a phone conversation with her mother saying, I'll see you in a little bit. But unfortunately, she never made it home that day, and this phone call would be the last her mother ever heard from her. This is the story of Kelsey Smith. Kelsey Ann Smith was born on May 3, 1989 in Overland Park, Kansas. She was the third of what would eventually be five children, born to her parents Greg and Missy Smith. As a child, she was described as inquisitive and eager to try new things. Later on, when she attended high school at Shawnee Mission West, she was popular and well-liked by her peers. She was involved in a multitude of extracurricular activities, such as track, theater, writer's workshop, art, and choir. She was especially interested in her school's marching band, in which she was a section leader. As such, she was excited to attend Kansas State University after graduating high school, where she would play clarinet in the marching band and study veterinary medicine. Unfortunately, however, she would never get the chance to do so. On June 2, 2007, Kelsey wanted to get a six-month anniversary gift for her boyfriend, John Byersmith. Her plan was to go to a local Target to get the gift and then meet up with him at her house afterwards. At around 6.30 p.m., she left her residence and went on what was supposed to be just a quick shopping trip. At 7 p.m., Kelsey had called her mother to inform her that she would be home by 7.30. But when 7.30 finally rolled around, Kelsey was nowhere to be found. This was unusual for her because her parents had strict rules about their children coming home on time, so Kelsey always made sure she was never late. Kelsey's mother and boyfriend, who were waiting for her at the house, tried desperately to get in contact with her by texting and calling. She would never answer, however. After about half an hour, Kelsey's boyfriend decided to call Kelsey's father, Greg, to inform him about the situation. Being a police officer himself, he knew right away that something was up. Shortly after receiving the call, Greg informed police and also reached out to some of his law enforcement connections for help, while Kelsey's mother and boyfriend went down to the Target to investigate for themselves. They didn't find Kelsey, but they did locate her 1987 Buick Renault in the parking lot. At this point, they began really worrying, because there's no logical reason why Kelsey would have left her car parked at the Target unattended. They could see the gift she bought for her boyfriend in the car as well as her purse, but nothing to indicate where she may have gone. The fact that the gift was left in the car was peculiar, because it suggested that she did indeed make it back to her vehicle. But this begs the question, what happened afterwards and why did she not return home after placing the gift in her car? After discovering the vehicle, Kelsey's mother and boyfriend waited for police to arrive at the scene and start their official investigation. The next day, Kelsey's missing person report was already out on the news, and a group of her family and friends, later dubbed Kelsey's Army, went out to distribute flyers of her to the public to see if anyone knew anything. Investigators also thoroughly searched her car for any clues and they managed to find unknown fingerprints on the steering wheel. Police then attempted to contact Verizon, Kelsey's cell phone provider, to see if they could get information on where her phone last pinged at a cell phone tower. This could have given them an indication of where she may have been. But because they were not legally obligated to do so, Verizon chose not to divulge this information. As such, police focused their attention towards the target security cameras because this was their only chance to find out what happened to Kelsey. What they discovered was very revealing. Upon reviewing the footage, it was obvious to police that she was being followed. Almost everywhere Kelsey went in the store, she was closely trailed by a male with a goatee who was wearing a white t-shirt, shorts, and sneakers. This individual can also later be seen leaving the store right as Kelsey was checking out her items. Armed with this new information, Kelsey's parents managed to get the FBI on her case, who were able to get the cell phone tower information from Verizon. Verizon then quickly sent out a technician to the last tower where Kelsey's cell phone pinged 
to further narrow down the vicinity of where she could have been. This led police to a wooded area in Missouri. Investigators were immediately dispatched to the area to look for her. Within 45 minutes, the body of Kelsey Smith was discovered. There was evidence that she had been sexually assaulted, but most shockingly, sticks and branches were left on her body in a configuration reminiscent of occult practices. Her father later stated that, quote, it may have been a pentagram. Now that Kelsey was located, the last thing police had to do was discover the identity of the mystery man from the target surveillance footage. This put his picture up all over the news, as well as footage of the 70s pickup truck which he was driving. Almost instantly, police began receiving dozens of tips. One of these tips came from a co-worker of the individual from the surveillance footage, who recognized his truck on the news. On June 7, 2007, Overland Park Police arrested 26-year-old Edwin Roy Hall on suspicion for the murder. Hall was found at his house packing bags with his wife and four-year-old son, seemingly ready to leave for a trip. At the station, police found that he had no adult record at the time, but had a violent juvenile history. At 16 years old, he had threatened his then foster sister with a knife. Police also quickly discovered Hall's MySpace page, in which he described his interest as, quote, eating small children and harming animals. Hall's fingerprints were then retrieved, which came up as a match to those found on Kelsey's steering wheel. Police subsequently searched his home, in which they found a shrine for Celtic religion that they believe may have been connected to the way Hall staged the scene at Kelsey's murder. On September 16, 2007, Edwin Hall was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the abduction, rape, and murder of Kelsey Smith. During his sentencing, he appeared to show remorse, although it's unclear how sincere he really was. I'm so, so sorry for what I've done. That's all I can say. As part of Hall's plea agreement to avoid the death penalty, prosecutors demanded a complete confession from him. He went on to tell detectives how he abducted Kelsey from the parking lot, sexually assaulted her, and proceeded to strangle her with her own belt. He also informed detectives that Kelsey was not specifically targeted, but she was a crime of opportunity. He had been at Oak Park Mall, where the Target Superstore was located, the whole day looking for a potential victim. He said that Kelsey had stood out to him because he, quote, liked her legs, and he also believed her to be a lot younger than she was. To this day, Edwin Hall is incarcerated at the Hutchinson Correctional Facility in Kansas, where he'll spend the remainder of his life. Although the crime he committed was absolutely despicable, there's one silver lining that came out of the whole ordeal, which was the invention of the Kelsey Smith Act. Previously, cell phone providers were not obligated to give authorities any subscriber information, even in a missing person situation, such as Kelsey's case. The Kelsey Smith Act mandates cell phone carriers release locational information of their subscribers to law enforcement officials in emergency situations in the absence of a warrant. The Kelsey Smith Act has undoubtedly saved the lives of many and will continue to do so in the future. Since its inception, this act has been adopted in 30 states, and Kelsey's parents continue to fight to have the act passed in every single state. For more information about the Kelsey Smith Act or to donate to the cause, please visit kelseysarmy.org. We would like to extend our deepest condolences to the family and friends of Kelsey Ann Smith.